Sure. Go ahead and go. Let's see. All right. All right. So pretty quick ones. Uh, first, I want to give you guys a follow up on a case. Um, remember, I showed you that lung transplant uh, recipient who was found to have this funny sort of cavitary space in the middle lobe uh, that oh. was initially thought, I think, by the surgeon maybe to be a pneumothorax, but we pointed out sort of this claw of lung here, convinced him this was actually parenchymal and that this soft tissue inside was quite dense on this. I only have these windows, but you see it's denser than normal tissue and that this was probably just a traumatic laceration secondary to the thoracotomy with some hemorrhage around it. And if we looked at the bones, um, you'll see that the, the thoracotomy defect, if I go up higher, the um, edge of it was a little bit, you know, there's a little bit more fragments than we often see where they just do a smooth cut. Um, so we did a follow-up CT. They didn't do anything. They just got a follow-up about five or six weeks later. And you can see this is just scarred down. And that's what's left of the hematoma, this little um, dense area here. And, you know, the ribs are starting to heal, that thoracotomy defect starting to heal a little bit up here. So it just sort of resolved on its own. Very interesting. Yeah, it was neat. Uh, this is a, a little fun case. This is something I'm sure you guys see. I mean, we're all going to see them, but I bet you see them a little bit more in San Francisco. Uh, my colleague, Daniela, sent this case to me. Uh, she saw these little metal things here in this patient's chest. And you can see I'll blow up on it a little bit there. It looks like there's a, like a little metal uh, dense thing and then sort of this little plate. And these are called these derma piercings, uh, which, you know, you, you see them. I've never actually thought about them, but what they do is they are microdermal piercings. They put this little plate just under the skin and there's a little stud that pokes out and then people can attach different jewelry to them. And I found this on the internet. I was Googling it. I'm sure the <laughs> people wondered what I was looking up, but you get all sorts of pictures. And they, these are from AliExpress of all places. <laughs> you could buy a set of them and interchange the, the jewel. But um, yeah, it's just causing this little funny artifact. So these are not little clips inside. I mean, they're technically inside the patient, but they're not inside the thoracic cavity. Um, but you'll probably start encountering these if you haven't already. Because a lot of times the patients, they can't take the base out, but sometimes they can remove the, 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 the jewel attached to it. And it looks like she has three of them and uh, where they, they were anteriorly. It looked like there's one right over midline. Yeah, one Maybe. right there. Yeah. And that's sometimes what they do. They'll do a pattern with them. Yeah, on Google Images, there were some very elaborate ones, and you know, all different parts of the body. I think most of them are put like in the ear and maybe along the face. Um, but this is the first one. I I didn't see them in the chest, or maybe I thought they were gown clips or something. But yeah, so. you have to take an incision to do these things. It yeah, it's like really yeah, but it's it's just under the dermis, so it's not very deep. But it is it's still an implanted foreign body. So who, who, is it in tattoo artists or uh, surgeons or what? I don't know. I'm no, guessing not surgeons. not surgeons. I'm guessing it's. Huh. Like, I'm guessing it's a at a piercing place. Okay. And what's the uh, what's the trade name for this this particular one? There isn't. I don't think there's a trade name, but the the technique is called dermal piercing. Deal. Microdermal piercing is what it is. Yeah. If you look up dermal piercing, you get uh, you get a bunch of these in stores that sell the things and. I don't know what they're made out of, and you know, I I don't know if they're they probably don't go through rigorous FDA approval and stuff like that. But you know, you know, you, I think you heard about some of these companies talking joke. I don't know how serious they were about putting chips under the people a workers' skin so they can you know, access security and stuff like that. They don't have to carry around stuff, but um, it's sort of like, or you know, there's the there was that Nor plant for uh, contraception that came around in the '90s where it was subcutaneous little uh, strips that had progestins and stuff but yeah piercing. well you know there was just an article in the paper this week about how in sweden a lot of people have microchips implanted in the skin of their hand and they use that for purchasing on their phones and stuff like that that's yeah. Yeah. so this is i guess similar but um yeah they're um, pretty widespread but you just don't see a lot of them on the, in the chest all right so this is a good case and a good teaching case for trainees of why we obsess over pulmonary artery catheter locations and we don't you know we don't use them a lot anymore the data doesn't show in most cases that just routine monitoring is very helpful but they are used occasionally in in certain selected cases and in this case um, we see the pulmonary catheter it goes down, loops through the, the right uh, atrium, right ventricle, out the pulmonary outflow tract into the right pulmonary artery. 
and now it's in the interlow bar and it's at this point it's gone too far down the interlow bar is up here and that's about as far out as i ever like them in theory you should pull them way back and park them there well this one got a little too far down and at some point uh, uh, when they were using this they either overinflated the balloon or left it up or something and the patient presented with hemoptysis and here's the ct scan with the pulmonary catheter still in place so um or did i grab the wrong scan i may have grabbed the wrong scan bummer um no there it is there it is there's a pulmonary catheter in place and you can follow it out into the middle lobe so it's no longer you'll see it's no longer in a large caliber vessel it's beyond the interlobar it's in the middle lobe pulmonary and then it goes out to the medial branch and then oops we've got this oops. pseudo aneurysm right there and then you can see oh, wow. hemorrhage around it you know and these can be fatal um luckily this one was quickly treated with, within a few hours and i just saved some selected images but they injected through the pulmonary artery catheter um, there it is and then they ended up just coiling it, which we'll take care of. And the patient's fine since that. But these are one of the complications, and that's why it's so important uh, when you're looking at anybody with pulmonary catheter, always keep an eye on these things because it's easy with all these other wires to say, oh, yeah, it's fine. But, um, you know, people report two centimeters from the hilar margin. I think that's kind of silly to measure. I look at the pulmonary artery, and if it's beyond the large interlobar, it's too far out. So, Jeff? The other thing that's happening here is this this catheter is heading anteriorly and you don't appreciate that on the frontal radiograph you look at it looks as if it's in a plane and it's heading downward but it's actually it's actually in a smaller smaller branch because it's heading so far anteriorly i think right exactly and let me put up a, i can show that on a sagittal and we don't know that i mean that ct was done three days after the radiograph but presumably they parked it there um, but yeah there's the anterior approach coming in right and that you won't appreciate that on the radiograph as david said because it flattens it but yeah and there's all the the blood from it so Oops. all right and then this is just a fun case i finally got around to downloading uh it was sent to me as uh papvr uh which i don't argue against but i think there's a little bit more to it um first thing we notice is there are no right pulmonary veins um and then there is this vein right here that actually receives several branches sort of complex branches but it drains right into the ivc at the junction so i would call this a scimitar and i think supporting that is the fact that the upper lobe bronchus or the upper lobe itself is abnormal it has a single branch the middle lobe has its two branches and the lower lobe looks pretty normal and there is a there is a fissure there's a little funny pleural fissure there and if we do a uh, let's see, a um, sagittal, and uh, let's go lung here. We'll see that the that right that right lung looks funny. Right. Yeah, there's the left lung there with a normal looking fissure, but the right has this funny domed fissure, uh, some accessory fissure here, and we don't have a we only have a single upper lobe bronchus. So I would call this a scimitar. Unfortunately, I don't have a radiograph. Um, I never got one, but. The right lung isn't particularly hypoplastic, maybe a little bit, um, but just that single, single airway there. And then here's the scimitar coming down. Mm -hmm. this just just, yeah. And this has two scimitar veins actually, but they come together. You see this one posteriorly and then anteriorly, you have the second one here. And that has been described having two scimitar veins, but they usually join together right at the right before they this one joins a little earlier but join right before they enter the ivc yeah i looked for Isn't systemic arterial supply system artery coming from the abdomen no the, uh, I to the lung. didn't see one of those didn't that see would diaphragmatic, be nothing with the diaphragm and this patient i believe is uh 70 years 60 years old so okay. this was an incidental finding in an older adult so okay those are my cases okay. for the week who would like to go next? I've got three uh, interesting ones. Oh, right. Hey guys, it looks like the jumping isn't happening anymore with the go to meeting either. Oh, yeah. We'll have to see. Right now, I'm using Horace just in case it's still a problem because it was for me last time. So, yeah, Jeff, Jeff, yours look good to me this time. I'm using an older Osiris because I haven't 
been able to update it on this reading room Mac yet. I'm also using an older version of Mac OS, so we'll have to see. Okay. So this first patient um, is a patient with a history of colon cancer. And let me just make sure I've got the right one. Yep. And she has pleural disease. She's got nodal disease in large nodes, and there's some pericardial fluid. I need to speak sure I've got the right patient. So in October, she, no wait, this is, no wait, this, let me just make sure I've got the right person. Nope, cancel that. This is a patient with a history of gastric cancer, excuse me. So backtrack and is known to have metastatic disease. So let me go back to August. And he's got pleural fluid with nodal disease. And if we look at the radiographic, clearly the lungs are abnormal. It might be a little hard to describe, but suffice it to say that they are abnormal nodules, small ones, and in some locations, like perhaps down here, I was pretty certain that I saw septal lines and peribronchial fluid cups, subpleural interstitial edema. At that point, I was thinking at least lymphangetic tumor spread, possibly in a patient with rather advanced tumor, but I did notice the presence of these other nodules and I will then go further and show you that sorry, let me get this in cuts here instead. You'll notice that now in October things have advanced dramatically. And in addition to worsening interstitial edema. Now we have many nodules and many small tubular opacities that I reported is very consistent with involvement of lobular arteries with tumor, intravascular tumor. And I wasn't sure, but I also wondered whether pulmonary veins were involved, but things look dramatically worse. So I reported extensive progression of disease and particularly with respect to the pulmonary arterial findings. Before I show you the next one, notice that there are small nodules in the airways which are new. So here in the inferior trachea, and then a relatively large one at the tracheal carina. And as you scroll down, you see more sub five millimeter nodules in the airways. And that wasn't really noted. Actually, I didn't read this one, but this one noted the other findings, but not so much the airway findings. So now I'm going to show you a follow-up exam, and I'll bring in the thin cuts again. Actually, did I get the right one? Okay, so this is the follow-up exam from November. And the most dramatic finding on this, in addition to the overall worsening of the disease, is the really dramatic and rapid growth of all of those small tracheal nodules. So now they're very large. So certainly this is very consistent with tremendous progression of metastatic disease, but with substantial intra-airway pathology. And this is an image from bronchoscopy. There is the biopsy, but here is the image from the bronchoscopy showing the large tracheal and proximal bronchial tree metastases, maybe one of the worst that I've seen. It's pretty dreadful. And you can see they try to ablate and, and laser out and burn some of those to try and open up the airway. So a very dramatic case of progressive metastatic disease with dramatic airway and small vessel involvement. Another one that is very close to this one is this patient. So this patient has a history of gastric colon cancer, sorry, and a biopsy, EBIS done in 
October confirmed the presence of nodal metastatic disease. So that's pretty dramatic. Let me show you the thin cuts on the same day. And as I scroll through these, I was struck by a lot of findings. Um, there is a pattern of mosaic attenuation, the areas of the lung that I wondered if they were abnormally black, but I wasn't really sure. There are other areas like this in which there's abnormal opacity and maybe even some abnormal vessels that were a little bit distended in this region. I also saw interstitial edema, peribronchial fluid cuffs, and septal lines consistent with lymphangetic tumor spread. But I was really concerned that there was maybe much more widespread intravascular disease than is initially apparent. So now I'm going to show you a short-term follow-up. So that's October 12, and the next one is just over a month later. And you'll see a tremendous progression of disease. So not only is there a lot more interstitial edema, there are also these large confluent ground glass attenuating opacities in the lungs. And then as I scroll through the lungs in general, look how distended the vessels are. And when I try to determine whether they were arteries and veins, I thought they were both. So all of these vessels are really distended. And I believe they're distended with tumor. And the right atrium got bigger, the right ventricle is bigger, there's undoubtedly pulmonary hypertension. So I reported dramatic progression of metastatic disease describing all the findings. They didn't really, I think initially some were skeptical that this could represent a manifestation of metastatic disease. So they did the usual things, including a BAL. But I think what clinches the notion that this is all tumor is that the bronchial lavage even has tumor cells in it. So I think that this is lymphatic, vascular, and a very large burden of tumor in the lung in that fashion, and even malignant cells in the lavage fluid. Howard, do you think any of that crazy paving looking stuff would be sort of like um, lipidic growth of metastases? Yeah, I don't know. Or do you think that's more just it's having it's to do with the lymphatic obstruction? It's so patchy and discreet. Yes. I think it's more lim yeah. uh, um, lipidic. I really don't know. It could be that. Um, it just developed in, in, a, in a short period of time. And together with the other findings of interstitial edema and lymphagetic tumor spread um, and the distended vessels, I just assumed it was a really dramatic case of lung edema from lymphatic obstruction. But I really don't know because I wonder about the pulmonary veins. I think some of the pulmonary veins may be blocked and maybe they're, they're blocked heterogeneously in terms of where they're blocked and maybe some of this is pulmonary venous hypertension from tumor obstruction of pulmonary veins even, in addition to the artery findings. But some of these vessels are definitely veins, not just arteries that are huge. Yeah, absolutely, On the, in the right upper lobe, you can see some that are, you, one finding I look for is you can, when you catch one sort of um, in plane, you can see its little side branches much more conspicuously than usual, like right yeah. there, you can see yeah. So I'm speculating that some of these yeah. are definitely even distended. Yeah. yeah, they're distended and you can see them anteriorly on the right pretty well. Yeah, very dramatic case, isn't it? It's impressive. And she, as you might expect, died pretty soon after this from the disease. All right, let's get the last one. Make sure I get the right context here. All right. So this unfortunate young patient in March was diagnosed with a gluteal region pleomorphic liposarcoma that you see there. I'm going to show you a CT of the chest starting on the same day. And there was nothing really there except for one finding. And you'll see in a moment why it may possibly be associated with what I'm going to show you subsequently. But at this time, the only finding in the lung is this one small cystic space right there in the anterior right lower lobe. Going forward in time to June, unfortunately, she develops metastatic disease. And 
there are nodules in the lungs of different sizes. But I'm going to show you this particular one here that is small, but contains the central area of cavitation. So that's one. And there is a slightly bigger one up here as well, and other small ones developed. So that is June. Now I'm going to go forward to August or September. Let's go to August. And you will see what happens to first that small lesion in the peripheral left upper lobe becomes this large lesion that is just a cystic space and it contains fluid in its deep end and portion. And with respect to the larger lesion, which is up here, this is, sorry, press the wrong button. That is the attenuation really up here of water. So it's close to water. So there were four Hounsfield units. And then I will show you what happens subsequently. She comes in in October. The lesions are getting bigger, as you'll see here when it comes up. But she also develops a pneumothorax at the same time. And then finally, I'll show you what it looks like in later October. And you'll see that there is really just a large confluence of these cystic lesions. So now they've grown together. And we have these large lesions that are really just air and water particularly in the left upper lobe. Other ones remain solid and growing, but a dramatic example of cystic metastases from a sarcoma. Sorry about that. Something Howard, there. the one you showed along the right hemidiaphragm on the initial scan, whatever happened with that thing? Okay, so it, was it lower down? Yeah, it was on the initial scan you showed us right, at, yeah, there it is, it's a little cyst right there. Oh yeah, that little guy. You know, I don't know if that is a metastasis because nothing's happened to that. But when I saw everything else, I wondered whether that was a metastasis from the onset, perhaps. We'll never know. But that hasn't grown. Sorry, I was going to almost forgot to mention that. But this is certainly one of the more dramatic growth of cystic metastases. They just basically became water and grew them and undoubtedly breached the pleura at some point on the left side. Yeah, you wonder if that one de-differentiated into some other type of, you said it was a pleomorphic because all the other ones aren't behaving like that. Howard, was there a chemotherapy that might have precipitated some she of the- has been there, and I don't know the details of that. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to change the window with the but Yeah, she has been treated. She has been treated, so that may be an influence. I don't really know. But this is really just water, basically. Hmm. Now, the fluid levels. Hmm. All right, those are my cases. All right, thank you. David or Travis? I've got a couple. All righty. <clears throat> So, can people see a CT scan? Yeah. Okay, we finally have a reasonable window. So this is a, a 92-year-old woman who was admitted after a ground-level fall. She probably had some syncope. She got a head CT and a neck CT, and on the neck CT, that this uh, gas collection in her lower neck and upper mediastinum was identified this and then that led to this CT scan which shows this extensive paratracheal gas collection um, she's from she's an immigrant from another country she's old and she does have this um, bronchiectasis in her right upper lobe so there's clearly been an inflammatory something or other and you know I'm thinking that this this is just an ordinary like congenital diverticulum it's very complex though let me show you what it looks like here on this MIPS here. You can see that this is really a, a very complex set of lesions up here. And then I think I have a uh, 3D airway study here, which I hope comes up properly. You can see that this is, again, a very 
complex set of little things. And it looks as if there's some saculation here or maybe some little diverticula here. And you wonder if one of these, if those things gave rise to the, these bigger lesions and stuff like that. So uh, my thought is that this is probably post-inflammatory and maybe related to the upper lobe bronchiectasis that we had here. And maybe she had some tracheal, some tracheal mucus glands that got infected and have formed these saculations and things like that. So Eric Stern showed me this case as the most extensive tracheal diverticula complex that he has seen and um you guys have any any suggestions this doesn't look like the simple no. straightforward single lesion of a congenital i think this is probably acquired i yeah i've seen um in patients with cystic fibrosis i've seen them with multiple diverticula and they can get quite big but <clears throat> quite a large one and uh, it was it purely one collection or maybe multiple ones <clears throat> i think this is multiple in this in this person <clears throat> Sorry, I just aspirated a pepper flake. <laughs> okay, so um, tracheal diverticular here in a complex that I think is uh, probably acquired, okay, from some sort of inflammation. This was not currently symptomatic, and <clears throat> after she was cleared neurologically and she went home, and we don't have any more follow up. And she has not been a patient at, at uh, Harborview before this uh, ground level fall got her admitted. <clears throat> to the trauma service. Hmm. Very curious. Okay. David, can you go back to the original images? Uh, was That trachea looks really scalloped, but I can't tell if it's just the reconstructions or if you, there's some underlying tracheal pathology. Yeah, it looks pretty normal. She's just breathing. Well, I, I th yeah, she's breathing. And the other thing that's going on here, I think, is that she does have, she does have this exaggerated um, sort of saculation up and down. It looks as if the the tracheal membrane sort of is bulging out between the cartilages excessively and things are generally dilated here. So, you know, you kind of think along the tracheomegaly spectrum and maybe this is just not quite megaly, but it, where you get the chronic inflammation and the, as you said, the mucus gland infection, you get sort of the accordion type look to the trachea. It's kind of what it looks like. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Or I think maybe, maybe a congenital, uh, sort of floppy trachea and then infection on top of that so that you exaggerated some of the features okay so i wanted to bring this case up as a as a segue to the next case i want to show you so this person's eyeglasses here are not in the proper location so we would call this um medically this is ectopia lentis so that is a provocative uh, statement that is designed to segue to this next case you guys like that? Is that a here's a chest radiographic pun for you? Oh, I thought you. you were, okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So here's our next case of a young man who uh, developed. I think he's around 20. Developed a spontaneous pneumothorax, and was admitted with this. And I was struck by the shape of his chest here with a mild pectus carinatum, and his uh, height, his elongation, and stuff like that. And I asked the residents. Just check and see if, if they were the thinking that this might, man might have Marfan syndrome. And lo and behold, he's known to have Marfan syndrome, which predisposes to pneumothorax. So since he came in with chest pain, abrupt onset of chest pain, people were very suspicious that he had a vascular problem. He, you know, the pneumothorax, I think, accounts for his chest pain. But um, here's his dilated aortic root, his effacement of the... Uh, sinotubular junction here. Um, he doesn't have an acute angle here at the top of his sinuses and stuff like this. So he indeed uh, does have Marfan's and I think he's got annular aortectasia here, the uh, Marfan's manifestation of his aorta. So he was not at this point having uh, dissection or aneurysm or any sort of aort other aortic problem, but he uh, is clearly at risk for aortic disease eventually. <clears throat> and um, let's just go back to the shape of his uh, chest wall here. He has this deeply inset spine here. He doesn't really have a straight spine. And he does have this mild pectus carinatum. So he's, he's got this kind of uh, inverted V shape to his anterior um, chest there. And is this sort of flattening is shaped like a playing card turn this guy on his side and he becomes hard to see because you're looking down the edge 
Now let's just check out here his um, cervical spine, is here his thoracic spine for straightening. It is somewhat straightened here through the thoracic spine. You can see how that compresses the heart <clears throat> against the sternum. Good thing that his sternum is actually bowing away from it. I've seen people with both pectus excavatum and straight spine here lacking the normal spinal lordosis, and that really can pancake the heart. <clears throat> so lots of skeletal findings here that suggested uh, Marfan syndrome. It turns out it, it was right. So I wanted to show you this case because it's one of the few times when uh, these casual suggestions turn out to be true. So I, I'm going to glory in this for a while. Oh, okay, yeah. Marfan's. Cool. Did you see any uh, his lungs that predispose him to the pneumothorax other than just weak tissues? Did you see any cystic or other spaces like that? I didn't see any when you were scrolling through quick. I didn't see any, any others on this on the scroll through too. Though I'll go back and look at that, and and I'll I'll make up a, a point of that when uh, I post this case. So here's a person with um, an interstitial abnormality that first looks like edema, uh, but it turns out it was it didn't resolve on diuresis, and um, he also has emphysema that seems to be worse in the bases. I don't know his smoking history at this point, um, but he's got this extensive coarse interstitial abnormality composed of septal lines. So besides edema, we're supposed to think about lymphangetic cancer and things like uh, lymphangiectasia. Sometimes there can be lymphatic things and sometimes uh, lymphoma uh, or sometimes LIP can give you a lot of septal lines and stuff like that. When we get down into the uh, abdomen, and there's just a little bit of tissue around the kidneys here. And this wasn't, this little rind here around the kidneys, which we have never completely imaged, um, was not present on an, on an earlier um, CT, abdominal CT from the outside hospital. Plus he's got some infiltration of his peritoneal fat. So he's got a lot yeah, of- Yeah, it looked a little- I'm sorry? The aortic area looked a little ratty too. Like when you were showing the kidneys, it just looks like there's a little infiltration of the fat around the abdominal aorta. Um, yeah, good point. So, the, yeah. yeah. So um, let me show you his. Uh, he got a. Uh, he had some neurologic findings. He had diabetes insipidus, and he got a. Um, he got a. A uh, pet uh, pet scan. Here's the. Uh, here's the. Um, SUV series here, and you can see he's got this peri kidney rind here of uptake. This is this is not normal uptake around the kidneys. And uh, if you look carefully at his orbits here, which I always do, he's actually got some orbital stuff there. I know you don't believe me. So here it is on. Let's enlarge this for you guys. Here it is on um, mm. that scan again. He's got this retroorbital uptake. And as we go on down, you'll see that indeed, as Travis, there's some stuff, vague uptake in the lung here. There's a lot of uptake around the aorta. And then let's look at that. Here's descending aorta with a nice cuff of uptake around it. And um, again, this perinephric uh, uptake, this rind here around the edges. And here's the aortic, the intense stuff that that uh, Travis was pointing out. Here's the stuff in the perineum showing up too. So of course this is Erdheim Chester disease. He had a lung biopsy, and this lung stuff, you know, I thought is it just passive congestion somehow, or is there some central problem that's leading to this? This was Erdheim Chester disease in his in his the interstitium of his lung. So this was biopsy proved. He had the BRAF mutation. And he's on an, an agent that handles that starts with V, and I don't, I don't have it in front of me, so I can't pronounce it for you. But he's on one of the imipsimab thingies that uh, handles the BRAF mutation, which is present in about half of the cases of Erdheim-Chester disease. So Erdheim-Chester here with dramatic interstitial abnormality and the typical perinephric stuff. And the second case in the last couple of months where there's retroorbital stuff. And his um, diabetes insipidus was attributed to intracranial disease affecting his pineal. So he's got retroorbital, but he also has, uh, you know, intracranial stuff too. 
And then the, wow. the background lungs are also very abnormal. They just hyper attenuated. There's too many cells in there. There's too much stuff in between the septal lines. Yeah, right. Um, very yeah. abnormal. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So ECD, Erdheim Chester disease. Um, and here's a person who has an abnormal diaphragm. So I want to show you this diaphragm. This is uh, this is 2017 um, with his bulgy right hemidiaphragm, mediastinum displaced to the left, lots of gut coming up there under the diaphragm. And on lateral view, it's elevated. It's a smooth elevation, but posteriorly it dives to normal height posteriorly. So it actually intersects the normal position of the left hemidiaphragm back here. So if this were paralyzed, it's so large, you'd think first of paralysis, it should stay, it should have a shallow arc rather than a steep uh, descent like this. It'd have a shallow arc that goes all the way to the posterior chest wall, and this doesn't. This has that, that posterior dive toward normal height, which goes along with eventration, um, a large eventration. And um, so here it is on CT, and again, it's got a fairly abrupt transition point here. It has decent thickness of muscle out here laterally. And if we look at the cruise, um, we can catch little bits of cruise. It's a little bit obscured by the position, but we do have normal cruise thickness down here. The other place to look for diaphragm thickness, for preservation of diaphragm thickness that argues against paralysis, is the anterior part of the diaphragm on, la on the sagittal reconstruction. So here's the opposite side with nice normal thickness anteriorly of left hemidiaphragm. Then we cross the midline and we get into this normal thickness here of right hemidiaphragm as well and starting to bulge at this point. So with a normal thickness here, we don't have atrophy. Um, we have a very large eventration. And then here's posterior, here's cruise on lateral view, which has normal thickness down mm -hmm. here. So uh, everything is lining up here for large eventration yeah not paralysis even though when you first see such massive elevation you think of um of paralysis so that that worked the analysis worked on that one too so i'm i'm bragging about that one and then um let me show you this case of a woman who looked like this a couple of years ago and then currently has some elevation of the right hemidiaphragm. Now, lung volume is lower here on both sides, and so both hemidiaphragms have come up, but this one is bulging. And on lateral view, you can see it's got this discrete bulge. So since it gets back to normal height posteriorly, again, if this is this is not paralysis, this would be eventration, if anything. Now, let's just compare the old, the original um, lateral, and you see there was not a focal bulge at that point. Everything was looking better. So what is the cause of this? Uh, do people acquire eventrations? Maybe they do, but this woman has another reason to have this elevation. That is massive metastasis to her liver, liver enlargement, pushing the diaphragm up. And this was yeah. a metastatic uh, retroperitoneal sarcoma. So liver enlargement and polycystic kidneys are two abdominal conditions in which I've seen elevation of diaphragm. And her, her elevation is the result of her liver metastasis and enlargement. And finally, I wanted to show a case of uh, mucositis with a good CT correlation. So <clears throat> when people have just had a, a stem cell transplant, you know, they're day zero or something like that. They've been neutropenic for a while. They're getting a lot of condition. They're getting a lot of fluid administered to them. Uh, because they're, they've often been on cytoxan or something like that, and they want to wash that out of the kidneys. So they're, they're getting lots of volume. They're also getting often platelet replacements, which contributes some volume, but also creates the, the possibility of getting lung edema from minor transfusion reactions, trolley. Uh, platelet transfusions will do that. Um, just give you a, a minor reaction, you get lung edema. So People end up with abnormal chest radiographs in this period of time, right after, uh, in the first several days after their bone marrow transplant. When they are uh, neutropenic, they're getting a lot of volume, and they are also getting mucositis. So 
her radiographs were nice and clear at this point. This is uh, before, and now we're at day, I think day six at this point. And you can see that um, vessels have gotten just a little bit fuzzy down here in the, in the right base compared to before. So here's our original radiograph with clarity. Here we've got some fuzz. We have lost about an inch of lung volume here on this side. Things are looking a little bit juicy up here. If we go to a, a lateral view, Sometimes we can see that the fissures are thickening. I think this fissure is a little thicker here. And this, is, this would be mild lung edema. That could be from the volume that she's getting, or it could be from the uh, capillary leak from the blood products that she's getting. Plus, these vessels down here have gotten fuzzy. Their boundaries are indistinct. And before, we could make out individual vessels pretty nicely. And now they seem to be sort of uh, matted together and fuzzed by stuff in the lungs. So, People are always worried about infection in this setting. Here's what CT looked like on the same day as this uh, radiograph that is turned abnormal. And um, she doesn't have much in the way of edema. Her fissures are a little bit, a little bit fat and fuzzy. She's got a little bit of stuff up here. And what she's really got in the bases down here is this peribronchiolar and peribronchial uh, abnormality in both lower lobes, pretty symmetrical a little bit of lung edema, a few thickened septa, and stuff like that. And this is a distribution of aspiration and aspiration bronchiolitis. So this is all attributable to her mucositis. Um, so I was talking to the pulmonologists about mucositis again this week. And um, what we see in the lungs, I originally thought was mucositis affecting the airways because, you know, your airway is uh, has a mucosa. It's rapidly turning over and stuff like that. And so when these people are chemotherapized and and um, they're going to get mucositis of their gut and their throat, <clears throat> their hypopharynx and all, and their esophagus, they're also susceptible to getting in their airways. And I thought that these basal findings were the result of the mucositis in their airways. <clears throat> it turns out that people are not symptomatically mucositic in their airways, but they do have the mucositis affecting their GI tract. They have difficulty swallowing, it's painful, and they aspirate. So this is really mostly low-grade aspiration from mucositis. So the mucositic findings, this basal crud, is not infection. The mo most important thing to recognize is that, is, is that it's all attributable to mucositis, and it will go away without any special treatment. So you don't need to treat this as pneumonia or as an ordinary aspiration pneumonia. This is a low-grade aspiration that goes with mucositis. It's really coming from the gut and not from the airways the way I first thought it probably would, would be originating. Now, the, the, the uh, bronchoscopists who uh, attend on the, on, this, on the bone marrow transplant service say that if they, if they do a bronchoscopy on somebody who has mucositis, very early, they will have um, a, a, a very transparent mucosa. It's as if their mucosa has really thinned and you can't see it. You can, they see, they, they see the wall outside the mucosa. So the mucosa seems to pale and stuff like that, but it's not friable, it's not, it's not bleeding and stuff like that, and it's not inflamed looking. But it does, originally, they, early on, they do get this kind of perhaps denudation, but it's not inflamed and it comes back in the, so these people can have the GI muco, uh, mucositis, but their bronchial mucositis is probably happening, but it tends not to be symptomatic. At any rate, mucositis, I wanted people to be aware of this. I know, I know Jeff and I have talked about this a lot in the past. Um, it's a familiar thing. So if you look at these people who had stem cell transplant in those like day four, day five, through about day 12, I think this person was around day 10 or so, uh, that's when you get mucositis and you get this basal crud that goes away on its own if you just wait it out. And David, on that image right there, the lower esophagus looks a little bit thick and there's some debris in That's there. right. Yeah, good point. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Yes, indeed, there is esophageal uh, mucositis here with, uh, with thickening. Hmm. Okay, so the findings we're seeing then on, on the radiographs are a combination of low-grade aspiration, atelectasis from the pain of mucositis and um, and often edema from blood products and from volume overload. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, see? All right, Travis. All right, you see a radiograph? Okay. 
Yep. Let me know if it's jumping. It looks like things may have may be fixed. Jumping. So, <laughs> I don't think I showed this case. This is from a couple months ago. This was the first of these devices that I have seen. And I have a, a more recent one that I'm going to show as a companion to this. And I don't know if you guys are seeing these or not, but I saw this radiograph and the history was evaluate for pneumothorax. And I got curious because this thing has what looks like two leads, one of which is going down somewhere one of which is going up to the neck. So it doesn't look like a typical vagal nerve stimulator. Right. So anybody know, have, have you guys seen this? No, I don't think so. Okay, well, well, I will going quite high up. How, how about yeah, for so it's, a, it's a good thought. It's not what this is. This patient has a history of obstructive sleep apnea and I never got a full view of this. I've seen probably a dozen of these now, but I will show you the next case, which just came in yesterday and this is one where we'll see the entire thing on on several of these images now in this case you can see this is a patient also with obstructive sleep apnea and they have a pneumothorax after placement of this so they've tunneled this into the chest wall and the superior lead goes under the jaw and this is stimulating the hypo hypoglossal nerve so this is a hypoglossal nerve stimulator. And so David, you will like this. This is not a stimulating lead, but a sensing lead. And so this senses the diaphragm. And so we've seen several of these being placed and it's now a surgical treatment for obstructive sleep apnea. And it apparently works very well. So these hypoglossal nerve stimulators, this lead will sense the motion of the diaphragm. And I think it's at end inspiration where, it, or end exhalation, I can't remember, I'll have to look it up here, where they, um, where it will actually then stimulate the hypoglossal nerve to open up the airway by, by uh, stimulating the tongue. So I had not seen these before, but this, this goes into the, to the, below the jaw to stimulate the right hypoglossal nerve uh, to mitigate airway collapse. So, yeah, so we've, we're starting to see a lot of these now. There's one approved device. I think there are a couple that have been used that they've had trials for, but this is the first. This is the first complication I've seen from one. This patient had a pneumothorax, and from the the clinical note, they knew that they had, they they knew they had an air leak here that you'll see. They heard an air leak when they were placing this sensor wire into the intercostal space. Are these put in by so, neurosurgeons? ENT. ENT. Okay. Yeah. At least at least this one was so. I think it's kind of interesting, right? And then you can see the implant There's that it will help the trunk, tongue protrude so it won't obstruct the posterior, uh, the posterior airway. So be on the lookout for these and for pneumothorax as a complication. Interesting. Now, this one, let's see, we'll do this case. This is a patient who just recently got path on. And I'll start with this case. This is a patient who had Actually, I'll go back to the original one. So we'll show the pre-transplant. This is a patient who had bilateral lung transplant. He's a man who's 60 years old at this time. Hang on, and there's second. not just one not really a diagnostic dilemma here. This patient has traction bronchiectasis. It's peripheral, subpleural. He has macroscopic or radiographic honeycombing. And so he's a patient with, with now histologically proved idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis after he underwent bilateral lung transplant. So this was in 2014. In 2015, he was getting one of his serial post bilateral lung transplant follow-up exams and had developed this nodule that was increasing in size relatively quickly. And this was, you know, they thought it might be infectious, but it was a little, little slower growth than that. He wasn't symptomatic. And of course, one of the things you worry about in patients with lung transplant is post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder, which this did turn, or, turn out to be. And so we see this, you know, we see PTLD occasionally. I'm sure you guys see it too with your transplant population, but they reduced his immunosuppression and also started rituximab. And this thing eventually went away and he was doing well. This is 2017. You can see there's really nothing left there. And I'll show you his scapula looks pretty good at this time, his right scapula. Then at the end of October, he came in this year and my resident, we were reading this out and, and had a good pickup here because it's kind of a corner shot, but you can see that he has this enormous expansile lesion 
involving his right scapula. And his lung is still normal. He didn't have a known malignancy. And you know, I've never seen a case personally of extra or of skeletal PTLD, but we kind of threw it in the differential and said, make sure he doesn't have a renal cell carcinoma or melanoma or anything else. But they biopsied this and this was confirmed as recurrent PTLD four years out involving his involving his scapula. Right. So I include a, this article, it's still a good article talking about PTLD. And both of these were associated with Epstein-Barr virus. There is an association. And usually we think about it happening in the first year after transplant, or at least our pulmonologists do. But this article talks about how you can see it in, you know, it, really any time after transplant. And while it's most often in the lung, it can happen elsewhere. I guess bone is supposed to be the, the least common. Uh, have you guys seen PTLD in bone before? Nope, this is my first. I remember. Or not. I have seen so, lymphoma affect the bone, though, so. Yeah. What kind, of, um, what right. kind of lymphoma was it? Was it a true lymphoma? No, it was, it was recurrent PTLD. Okay, yeah, okay. yeah, it was okay. EBV positive. All right. uh, I'll, right. I'll include the histology from the, the surgical lung biopsy, but that's what it was. So, and then I will show one more bone case, which is pretty interesting because this is something else that I haven't seen before. This is a young patient who's 31 years old. And we were actually given a history of Poem syndrome. And I think he was short of breath, uh, but I don't, you know, he's got a small right effusion. But what's really interesting in his case is his bones. And you can see that he has a lot of punctate osteoblastic lesions, but he also has these these almost like I like Jeff. I like to call them the in this case bone Cheerios. Some of these because it's really what some of those look like. They're frosted Cheerios. You have these, yeah, right. And um, so I got to looking. I don't know. Has any have you guys seen this in the setting of Poem syndrome before? And of course, Poems being a, a polyneuropathy, organomegaly. Can't remember what the E is, but the M is the monoclonal or M protein, uh, I forget now. I've got it in this, I never remember it, but I've got it right here. So uh, endocrinopathy and then skin changes. But he um, you know, he has a, obviously has a monoclonal gammopathy. And these are presumably from what I've seen in the literature that these are all little plasma cytomas and can be of three different types. They can either be sclerotic they can be lytic or they can be what these are, the, the Cheerios being mixed sclerotic and lytic lesions. And so I went digging through the literature and I've seen a few different, you know, a few different um, publications where they show these types of things, but I had never seen this look before. And um, there's not a lot of great literature, but some of them show very similar. These are more the sclerotic ones, but at least a few of these had those, the lytic ones as well. So this one is looks more destructive. And I, I'm trying to figure out if you can distinguish these from actual like plasma cytomas or multiple myeloma. And it's really hard from, from all I can gather. But the computer here, just give me one second. But if you see a pattern like this, this looks apparently it's supposed to be pretty specific for poem syndrome. So wow, that's very interesting. I like bone. No, not this one like that. I've seen one with bigger lesions in the pelvis, as I remember. Yeah. Not, not these small yeah. guys. Like I mean, that. look at all these. That vertebral body has like three or four bone Cheerios alone. So it's a ball of fun. <laughs> yeah. That, so. All right. Well, yep. thank you, Travis. Okay, cool. All well, right. I'll say, yeah, that was the largest all one. Right. I'll save a couple of other cases for next week. So all right. talk to you guys later. Great, yeah. thanks. Great cases, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.